So we recently conducted a study on squats versus hip thrusts, finding that squats and hip thrusts in untrained individuals are equally effective for glute hypertrophy. Was this an unexpected finding for you? Yeah, I thought hip thrusts were gonna slaughter squats. So this is- And I think most of the people in the industry thought squats were gonna slaughter hip thrusts mm -hmm. and they tied. So one critique, let's start with that, is that we, or you, <laughs> chose the subjects of the study specifically to make the study look better for hip thrust because we recruited people that couldn't squat. What do you think about this? Is this a valid concern? <laughs> um, no, no, it's not valid. First of all, you and I had nothing to do. So we funded the study. And for Menno's listeners, I want to give Menno a shout out here because when you contacted me, you're like, Brett, let's get this done. And I had gotten a quote and it was going to be 80 grand. And I was reluctant to tell you, because I was like, God, there's, this is gonna be so much money. Who's gonna donate 40,000 of their own dollars? And you didn't bat an eyelash. You're like, okay, I'll split it with you, let's do it. So we funded the study, but we had, we had some input with how the study was planned. Not much though, it was kinda, you know, Daniel and Mike planning most of it. Mm -hmm. And we didn't, we had nothing to do with, uh, with you know, the training, the data collection, the analysis, nothing. So, but first of all, so first of all, we didn't have anything to do with that. We didn't select the subjects, we didn't handpick them. And second of all, uh, it's wrong, it's also wrong. There were only like three of the subjects that couldn't squat exactly. deep. Interestingly, one of them, because Daniel showed the silhouettes, one of them, what, what was he, six foot eight? And he, uh, it had the worst squatting proportions I've ever seen. He was like doing a quarter squat, but interestingly, that guy grew his glutes well. His glutes grew well doing like quarter squats, but, uh, but most of the subjects could squat deeper than parallel. And yeah. you know, it's, it's, so one, crit one critique was that our subjects didn't squat deep and they did, but another critique from the same group of people was that Brett planned out the study to give the hip thrust a like a advantage. an advantage because squats take you a while to get coordinated at. And around the exact duration of the study is when you'd finally start getting gains that were more than neural. And it's funny because when people have confirmation bias or when they're looking for something, they, they tend to be really good at critiquing studies when they mm -hmm. contradict what they want it to see. Um, and yeah, if, if, if squats would have came out ahead, people wouldn't have had that critique. In fact, mm -hmm. I don't mean to, I don't want to start a war here, but you can look at, you can look at uh, like Chasm, Coach Chasm and I remember he recorded a podcast on the Barbalo study that we now know is fake. But he, before we knew it was fake, well, I always knew it was fake, but before it came out that it was fake, they had criticisms of that study. They basically went over that study and they didn't say any of the stuff that they said with our study. They were like, mm -hmm. squats aren't a good glute exercise. Like basically like, I don't know what they think lunges or like single leg leg press would be better. But in, with squats, it's the quads that fail first, not the glutes. So it's not a good exercise and uh, stuff like that. They didn't mention that when squats came out ahead. So that's human nature. Mm -hmm. We're all like that. Yeah. And, and it's important to know that. And I, I wasn't meaning to bash Chasm here because he's a very analytical guy. And no, no one will sit there and think about things more than, more than him. But we're all the same way. When something doesn't match what we'd expect, we really scrutinize it. And so it was interesting to see how that study was received by the industry because yeah. I feel like I'm the only guy who came out and said I was wrong. I didn't hear one other male in the industry say I was wrong. You know, I feel like 90% ha like of the males in the industry should say, should have made a post saying, wow, Guys, I was wrong. I've always said hip thrusts suck, and here they tied squats. I, I would have thought mm -hmm. squats would have beat hip thrusts, but I'm the only one who said that. I said I was wrong. I thought hip thrusts were going to win, and they tied. 
but it didn't fit my confirmation bias. But I, I felt like, or it didn't fit my, what I predicted. So, so I kind of think that it's just something in beginners. And if you have more advanced, they'd see better results doing hip thrusts, especially given that we had to match, we had to equate volume. I feel like people talk about, you know, all this study on long lengths versus short lengths, but uh, this opens up another debate. Stuff that works you at shorter lengths doesn't get you as sore. And it depends on the muscle and the movement, because some muscles don't ever really get real sore. Mm -hmm. You know, do, you, do your delts ever get that sore? You know, it's like... Yeah, never. But so, some muscles that don't get too sore, it's like no big deal. But once, some muscles that do get sore, th those, if you train them at short lengths, you could do them every day or like every other day. Mm -hmm. For glutes, I know you could do hip thrusts my, my girls could do hip thrusts every day. They could do them five days a week. They don't get beat up from them at all. I get so beat up from actually, them a little bit. Uh, I'd like to tie into that because um, there is a prevailing belief or a more popular belief right now that all exercises are exactly equally injurious. And there is no such thing as a wrong way to do an exercise. Butt weight during the squat, perfectly fine. Uh, knee valgus, perfectly fine. And some people take this to extremes, literally saying that, well, all exercises are literally equals. It's all just about volume management and the body can adapt to anything. What do you think about this? Do you think that, because you said, well, hip thrust, maybe you tolerate them better. So they would say, well, actually, it's all just a matter of volume. I mean, the, the, that's only something that came up more recently from people who sit at their computers. <laughs> I mean, if you work in a gym, you know. I remember having this debate with Stu McGill back in the, in the 2000s, like maybe the two, 2000, like 10 ish era. I was like, Stu, people don't hurt themselves doing crunches. You know that when you live in a gym, mm -hmm. like you're here, this is where I live. I'm here as I'm here more hours than I'm at my home. And you know that crunches never hurt anyone. And I, of course, there's going to be the one listener that's like, I hurt myself doing crunches, but I've never seen anyone in my whole life hurt themselves doing crunches. Have you? Nope. No. It's like when back extensions, because Stu, Stu may go back and they said back extensions are injurious. And I'm like, I've never seen anyone hurt themselves doing back extensions. If they hyperextend, they can get some back pain, but not like an injury. And so when you're in a gym all day long, you learn which exercises hurt people, like what exercises cause injuries. It's always squats and deadlifts. And for bros, it's like bench press, mm -hmm. military maybe, like bent over rows maybe, but like it's... The, those are the most popular exercises, weighted dips, like things like that. It's never, these machines very rarely hurt people. Plate loaded things and single, well, single joint stuff, they don't cause outright injuries. They can cause more chronic issues. Like if you are, are always heaving heavy dumbbells for ladder raises and, and doing like heavy, uh, you know, like pullovers and flies, I feel like you got to be stricter with lighter weight with those. If you always try for progressive overload, you tend to get your elbows get beat up mm -hmm. and things like that. But they don't cause like actual a lot of muscle strains and like where you see someone, you know, deadlifts, you'll see someone they hurt their low back all the time. Um, you know, you, you mostly low backs, but squats, people's hips start hurting, knees, low back, you name it. So I don't yeah. agree with that at all. I vehemently disagree that all exercises are, are but, but I also like the balance because it used to be, remember when it used to be like, if you round your back, you're like back, back when I used to show some back rounding in 2010, people would call me the worst trainer in the world. And now the pendulum swung the other way. And now it's like, oh, you can, the, the industry's kind of saying, you can gradually build up to anything. You can do Jefferson curls and, you know, and your, your spine can adapt and you can strengthen the soft tissue to the point where you can tolerate anything, which I don't quite agree with, but I do like the balance. I don't, I hated when, especially when the, the postural police, like you do a crunch and people are like, you're going to stay in kyphosis. And I'm like, ugh, that's not the way it works. Yeah. I think also there is a balance there where on the one hand, anecdotal evidence certainly suggests that certain exercises evoke a lot more injuries than others. And with squatting also, it's certainly my experience that people with back pain generally have less pain when they squat with what we consider good form, with more neutral oh, sure. pelvic alignments. 
<laughs> so, another thing to mention is people get injured more with the exercise they care about more. It's like no one yeah, cares about their seat. No one cares about their seat. No, it's the intensity and well effort, because you know, like you're not going to injure yourself doing. Well, I've hurt myself doing seated rows when my back is <laughs> when my back is hurting. But like you don't care about your seated row strength as much as you do your bench press. Mm -hmm. So if, if something feels off, you're just, I'm just not gonna do seated rows today, but how many times does something feel off and you're, you still, bend, you, you do your warm up sets with bench and you're like, ah, oh, I feel a little strain right here, or my front delt, or my, well, something's feeling off, but you push it anyway, because you care so much about your bench press strength. Circling back a bit to the squats versus hip thrust study. So one perspective is that the study favored hip thrust because they were beginners. However, another perspective, which is, I think, popularized mostly by Chris Beardsley, is that actually in beginners, you should see maximal stretch media hypertrophy because you're supposed to get lengthening of the muscle fascicles. And that's presumably limited because some muscle can only get so long. And therefore, in beginners, we see mostly stretch media hypertrophy, but in advanced individuals, we should expect to see less. And indeed, most studies at the moment are an untrained individuals. So how much credence would you give to the stretch media hypertrophy phenomenon being just relevant for beginners? So this is something I asked Paul, because um, Paul and Chris have their podcast. And Chris, first of all, I'm a big fan of Chris. Like Chris and I used to have a research review together. And it's been interesting to see him come out of his shell more where he used to just report the research. Mm -hmm. And then he's, now he's, he's really gone out on a limb and made bold predictions. Like, he, you and him were from some of the first people that were like, no, there's not three mechanisms of hypertrophy, there's one. Like, it's just tension, which I still don't claim to know the answer to. I still, you know, you and I look at studies, and there's so many physiology studies that are just mm -hmm. so... I mean, I can't tell you these papers that I download and I have no clue. I, I read them, I send them to Brad. There's so many anabolic chemicals in the body, like so many pathways, like SMAD3 or something. They have these crazy names. And I feel like every month there's a new mm -hmm. crazy term, these pathways that are just, that, and I don't, I'm more of a physics, biomechanics person, more mathematical. Um, I don't, my strength is not physiology, although I like reading it. So I do think that metabolic stress and muscle damage, there could be some way that it benefits, but you, you guys were, he and you, and I think you guys were some of the first two to say, regardless of whether those contribute, it is mostly mechanical tension. Mm -hmm. you, right, you were very right in saying that. And Chris then has gone out and said some more really um, bold claims um, with his neuromechanical matching stuff, with this stretch mediated hypertrophy stuff. And what I'm, I guess it's a kind of like a terminology issue right now, is they will say stretch mediated hypertrophy only means sarcomerogenesis, like sarcomeres in series. Mm -hmm. And I think the industry uses it as a term to kind of say, it's not just sarcomerogenesis, it's just that you get greater growth working a muscle in the stretch, and it could also be sarcomeres in parallel. Mm -hmm. You know, it could be myofibrillar genesis or whatever, yeah. like, I don't know, yeah. what do you think? That has been measured, yeah, that the muscle also gets thicker. Yep. And we also see that the muscle also gets stronger at shorter lengths, which would also not be in line with the muscle just becoming longer. So I think, and in animal models, we see it very convincingly that the muscle really gets thicker, and like, and a lot thicker. So the, I think the stretch media hypertrophy phenomenon is, is real. Yeah, and probably one of the biggest revolutions of the last like maybe decade in exercise science. That said, it is still a big limitation, regardless of whether it's just sarcomere genesis, that we have very limited research in trained individuals. And uh, well, because half of me, I know I'm biased because I've been saying hip thrusts are the best thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, I invented the hip thrust, so I'm gonna say they're the best thing since sliced bread. I'm super biased. I try to not be biased, but I am. I can't possibly not be biased. And so um, I've been telling people work the glutes at short muscle lengths for so long that I look at the long length research and I'm like, 
I'm, like I said, with Chasm being critical of short length mm -hmm. stuff, I'm critical of long length stuff. So, so why would the glutes benefit from short length stuff particularly? Well, we can talk about neuromechanical matching in a second, but what I wanted to say before that is, I look at all the bodybuilders, and I'm like, they've always done all the exercises. Like, if you were gonna work your pecs, would you just do all, wouldn't you throw in pec deck mm -hmm. for the squeeze? If you're doing biceps, yes, do a few, do two movements that work you in the stretch, but throw in a concentration curl at the end. Mm -hmm. So it's like, but I don't think there's much evidence on including short, short lane stuff. No. We don't have much research on it, but that's what the bodybuilders have always done. So you're saying the bodybuilders were doing things suboptimally this whole time. They could have had, you know, I mean, greater. Possible. It is very possible. Or it's possible that like what Chris and Paul like to say that it tapers off over time and then you're just getting, and then the short length stuff provides just as much value as the long length. And for the glutes specifically, there is extra reason to think that they yeah. would benefit from short length, right? And that would be the neuromechanical matching theory. Basically, um, the nervous system is gonna realize the leverage that a muscle has or a subdivision of a muscle, and it's gonna deliver more juice to that muscle according to its leverage. Uh, for example, if you're deep down into, you know, in deep hip flexion, maybe it makes more sense to activate the adductor magnus um, more than the hamstrings because the hamstrings are a, a at a short muscle length mm -hmm. and they don't have the best leverage. Whereas uh, as you come up into full hip extension, maybe you know the the, the CNS says, look, it makes more sense to activate the gluteus maximus because it has the best internal moment armor, the best leverage at that range of motion. And I, I think that's very plausible. It makes sense, uh, um, but I know they mentioned that there's a lot of evidence. Uh, in fact, Chris just made a post on this. But I, I think, I know he mentions activation and like where a muscle activates the highest. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of research on that, but our studies show that EMG activity didn't predict hypertrophy. I don't think it's worthless, but I think it's, it doesn't take into account the stretch. Mm -hmm. But, and as Andrew Vygotsky has pointed out, EMG, surface EMG uh, in particular doesn't take into account the architecture of the muscle. And so when you have like heavily penated muscle, you can get overestimations in EMG in basically the uh, like the the neural drive to the muscle, so it doesn't quite match. So anyway, that is one theory. And I remember long before I ever no, I never heard of this neuromechanical matching. That's something I heard from Chris, and I'm like, mm -hmm. oh, it has a name. Um, and I think I think he got that from uh, respiratory muscle research. Yeah, it originated somewhere else, not an exercise science. With re respiratory muscle research. So I was postulating that with my, my uh, first year PhD proposal. I remember my, my reviewer was Justin Kiao. He, he's a researcher in strongman. He, he likes to look at strongman training. He, he questioned me on that. And I said, and I, I, I mentioned uh, the uh, Nemeth study we always reference from way back in the day, showing that the gluteus maximus has the, out of the, all the hip extensions, it has the best leverage in full hip extension. And I said in my proposal, like, the, like it makes more sense that the brain would activate this, or the, the whatever, the, the nervous system would activate this muscle the best in this position because it has the best leverage. And, um, and it's not just moments are miter, it's also the, probably at least the length tension relationship that's favorable, right? So the, based on yeah, it the would research. be the yeah it, it would be I mean theoretically your brain would take into account the torque potential mm -hmm. theoretically your brain would consider both because torque would be leverage times force perpendicular yeah. force and your force production would have to do with the size of the muscle and then also uh, the length tension relationship the basically the sarcomere length mm -hmm. and 
I don't know if we have a research on the gluteus maximus sarcomere length. And I used to think, oh, OpenSim, this is a biomechanical software. I went by that and then, <laughs> uh, long story, but uh, there's two different OpenSim models that do musculoskeletal modeling mm -hmm. and they give totally different values. And you realize it's researchers just making guesses on how to fit. You have to make a lot of assumptions. So then I don't trust that. I don't trust EMG, but people tend to rely on different things to make predictions in our industry. They will look at, you got guys who care a lot about EMG and guys who say it's worthless. Guys who care a lot about, you know, uh, functional anatomy, mm -hmm. but there are things functional anatomy can't predict either. You know what I mean? Uh, it, you know, uh, things don't always line. That's why we need longitudinal studies, yeah. but it's always going to be the wild, wild west in our industry because longitudinal tutors are so f far and few between. Because like yeah. you're, you're in my, who, who in this industry has donated 40 grand of their own money like we did to fund I a do, study? I do have to say it wasn't all 40K of my own. I've donated more with all the other studies combined. But for this particular study, it was also other donation money, just to be precise. What was your personal, your research? Institute? Yeah, the research institute also had donation money. That's pretty much gone now, but... Um, but my, my point is, you could have used that for anything. Buy a nice car. <laughs> you could have bought a nice car with it. Who does that? Um, and so, like, there's also kind of a gap in between what the internet argues about, what mm -hmm. you and I care about muscle hypertrophy. Yeah. We're bodybuilding, um, you know, like bros. We're bros. We're scientific bros, but the professors don't always care about the same stuff we do. They're not always going to carry out, you know, a lot of times they're looking at, and also it depends what tools they have. It's like, I remember when vibration platforms were popular, there was all this research on whole body vibration. Mm -hmm. And if you have a force plate, you want to use it all the time. If you have, so it's like, we, the reason why our study was so expensive is because we had to use MRI because that's the gold standard for hypertrophy, but especially for the glutes. Like I would trust ultrasound for biceps or like, you know, quads, mm -hmm. hamstrings, but with glutes, it, it, ultrasound is tricky because you're just looking at a muscle layer underneath. There's no bone, it's fascia. And, you know, I use that for my PhD and I'm like, I don't, I don't fully trust ultrasound. I don't know. I know some of the studies have come out using ultrasound. I don't trust it. I think there are more, yeah, I've heard it before. I'm not an expert on uh, ultrasound measurements, but I've heard it before from people that are experts in it that say it's very difficult at the minimum. I mean, I remember uh, I looked at like, I experimented with like five subjects. This was 10 years ago, but yeah. One of the subjects was my girlfriend at the time. And I'm like, I can't see the fascia layer. I'm adjusting the gain and the depth. And I'm like, I don't like this. <laughs> I like things like, broad jump where you see the starting line, you see where you land and you mark the distance mm -hmm. and you measure that. And it's, there's no yeah. getting that wrong, you know? Well, so speaking of um, EMG, cause that's also what we measured. And um, by the way, some other tidbits about <clears throat> neuromechanical matching. I think one big limitation of the theory that we still have is that when you go to failure, all of that stuff might go out the window. Like the body recruits preferentially the muscle fibers with the best leverage or the best torque potential. But then when you go to Good failure, call. it's, it's all hands on deck. So Good it point. might not matter anymore at that yeah, point. Yeah, when you max out or when you go to failure, yeah. why, wouldn't, why wouldn't you activate everything? But then the actual tension produced internally by the muscle, that should still matter because that's hard mechanical tension. So you would think that hip thrust beats squats on that regard. And in EMG research, we see that hip thrusts clearly win. And we also saw it in subjective muscle tension, like people feel the glutes more. But still, they, they, are, they seem to be equal. So there must be something else, stretch medial hypertrophy, maybe passive mechanical tension, that makes squats compensate for the lower active tension, which is, I think, almost certain with yeah. versus hip thrust. That's interesting because there has to be some balance there. And that might also mean that in the end, but I think we've both been saying it in the long term, you want both because Yes, you get stretch media hypertrophy, and based on the current research, stretch media hypertrophy seems to be right. like much bigger than we thought. 
but yep. hip thrust win out on the other guard and might be easier to recover from. So in the end, you're probably better off with a combination, if not purely for muscle hypertrophy, then at least in practice for recovery and not uh, getting hip injuries and the like. You know, it's funny because um, I feel like, you know, I'm in here training women all day long. I remember one of the camps, this, this guy was, he goes, hack squats are the best exercise for your glutes. Hack squats. Right. And the people with the best glute development are always doing hack squats. And I'm like, what the hell? Hack squats, I feel, I guess the girls like them if they put their feet forward. I don't feel them in my glutes at all, even if I put my feet forward. I do hack squats for quads. In fact, I feel so much quads, I almost can't do hack squats all the time because they work too well. They hurt my knees. They hit my quads so freaking hard, it's almost like I can't, I can only do like one set to true failure. Because yeah. those are the thing ones where you can do breathing ones where you're like, <laughs> you know, I've done like, and it depends on the hack squat machine, the angle of it, because <laughs> the steep ones are a lot harder, but I've, you know, I've had times where I've had certain machines where I've had six plates per side, and I end up getting 10 reps. But most people would quit at five, and I ended up getting 10 by breathing and just keep pushing myself. And then I'll, I could be sore from that one set for like f five days, you know? Um, but um, anyway, dudes tend to, like especially dudes who are popular on the internet, they look at other dudes who are on steroids. And then they'll be like, just train like Ronnie Coleman, he had huge glutes. And yes, if you do steroids and you just train your legs, you just do squats and lunges and stiff leg deadlifts, you're probably gonna have decent glutes. But women, a lot of women have been doing that, that's what they did. For example, I have this client, Irishna, right? she's a wellness competitor, she's an Olympian. And she has these huge legs and they've been telling her, you need bigger glutes. So when she came to me, I'm like, Yurishna, like your legs are insane. You should stop training legs because we, we can get those big when, when we need. We can start doing squats and leg press and all the quad movements and all the hamstring movements, but you need to bring your glutes up. Quit doing legs. Just do hip thrusts and all these machines I have here. I showed them all to you. I've got all these plate loaded, abduction and kickback and hip thrust machines. Do these three times a week for like a year. And, and I go and quit going to these other trainers. She's, you know, here in Miami, there's a lot of Brazilian influence. And you've seen these Brazilian coaches that kill you. They'll yeah. do like yeah. drop set to where you're trembling on the ground. I'm like, quit going to these other trainers that like, want to destroy you because then you can you can't you, we, if I want you to train glutes three times a week you can't do too much a lot of times you and I do two sets two hard sets of each exercise we'll do four or five exercises so she's doing 10 working sets three times a week so she's doing like you know say 30 30 to 40 sets a week that's not easy to do you can't have these crazy drop sets you know and, and you can't have five sets per exercise to failure. So anyway, I told her to do that and her glutes have, and same with her friend Bobby, you know, my client Bobby Manu, her glutes have skyrocketed. But it's funny, because then I have Amanda and Vika. They've been injuring, like basically squats and deadlifts have been beating them up lately. And they're not doing crazy volume on them. They've just been in a rut. So I said, let's take a break. Like, let's take the emphasis off squats and deadlifts and let's start focusing on hip thrusts and kickbacks and let's start focusing on glutes for a while. And their glutes are growing like fast. Mm -hmm. Like everyone's like, what's, what's going on? Your glutes are growing huge. So I feel like there's what the industry, the scientific people say, which is ironic because they're supposed to be scientific. And then there's what I see in here. And I will tell you, um, I don't know, I, if, I'm, if I'm trying to maximize a woman's glute size, because you also have to consider, like, yeah, most women don't want giant legs. Mm -hmm. We do. Men, are, you and I want every muscle to be bigger. If you were like, do you want your traps to be disgustingly huge? We'd be like, yes. <laughs> do you want, you know, I, I would, I love the way I look when I'm pumped up. Like, 
When I do delts, I, if I could just look that way, I would give my house for that. Like mm -hmm. if I could just look that way permanently because I, I like the way it looks pumped up so much. But women don't want giant legs. So you see some of these guys that are like, like Mike Israel released a video on YouTube. Mm -hmm. He's like, it's the scientific way to grow the glutes. And, uh, and it was like all stretch position movements. It was like, and he also worked this, these clients so hard. I'm like, that's not the way you train people. And like, that's, that's what you do when you get someone to, who comes to you. That's what I told Yurishna, do not go to that pe person. Quit going to that trainer that wants to impress you. Mm -hmm. Quit going to that trainer that wants to cripple you. Because, you know, the typical client's like, oh my God, I was sore for a week. You're amazing. And if that, if that happens to me, I go, no, I screwed you. I should have not pushed you too hard because I want you to train glutes three times a week. And I know there's the research on frequency, but I'm telling you, in practice, the girls grow their glutes the best, hitting it three times a week um, and doing a variety, like short, short and long position stuff. But... <laughs> I don't know. I don't mm. think uh, like like Mike Mike's workout was like, you know, sumo squats, uh, and then like deadlifts or good mornings, and then like I think he did like two types of deadlifts and then lunges, like lunges to failure, and then like deep leg press, um, uh, no abduction, no kick, no short position, no hip thrust, no kickbacks, no abduction, nothing for the upper glutes, and this would leave my girls sore for like a week. And I don't think that's the right way to train people in the long run. I think that's what you do when you're trying to impress people and to think you're a good trainer, but that's not what you do when you're a real trainer. When you're a real trainer and you actually work with, I work with 30 girls in here every week, week in, week out. I have 30 girls in San Diego that I work with too. And I'm back and forth between San Diego and here. So when you work with 60 different people and you're observing and you're tweaking, you don't want to kill them too much. You don't. So, yeah. so in this sense, you put a decent amount of stock into your practical observations versus just Absolutely. scientific ones. Mm -hmm. How do you feel about how much a person feels a muscle when they're exercising? Yeah. Like, is that important? Because you said, for example, delts, they never get sore. Some people, so they never feel them. Does that mean they, they're not training that well? So you, I know where you're going with this because of our hip thrust study. In our hip thrust study, everyone felt their glutes more during hip thrusts. Mm -hmm. Daniel asked every subject, where do you feel your glutes the most during squats or hip thrusts? Every subject said hip thrusts and they tied in muscle growth. So it wasn't the exercise they felt working the most. And I think that's important for people to know. So I use both. Like when I'm training someone, they go, I, when I go heavy with hip thrusts, I don't feel my glutes anymore. I go, it doesn't mean that they're not working. Or if they're like, I don't like doing squats or I feel RDLs all in my hamstrings or I feel squats all in my quads. Like, that doesn't mean it's not work. You know, it could be stretching the glutes under load and you might not feel it till the next day, like lunges, especially you don't typically feel necessarily feel lunges being the limiting factor, but you tend to feel them the next day mm -hmm. or two days later, even more. But so how much do you adjust a program based on the client's individual feedback of what they feel? I, so when you're an online trainer or like in real life, you, you take that into account big time. Um, in here, I'm adjusting everything to their individual preference, but that doesn't mean, and the reason why is because I can find a squat that they like mm -hmm. and that they feel, but that's why what my job is easier because I'm a, an actual trainer. I've got all these, I've got this giant gym with all the bells and whistles. Online, you prescribe someone squats and they go, I don't feel squats. Well, you can't tweak things. You can't say, well, let's try this lever machine squat we have. Mm -hmm. Let's try this, you know, tweak. Let's try box squats. Let's try, uh, you know, I, I can try everything. I can go, let's try low bar, let's try box squats, let's try putting a band, let's try Smith machine and putting bands on them. Let's try sumo stands, let's try this. I can tinker with everything. I've got my T-bell there, right there. I can say, let's stand on the blocks and see if you feel them this way. But even if they don't feel them, I try to say, you gotta do some exercises like, our formula in here is do a type of hip thrust 
you know, mm -hmm. do a do do a something that works the quads and glutes. So it's going to look like a squat, either one or two legs. Do a hip hinge, something for the hammies and glutes. Mm -hmm. You know, something that keeps your legs more straight, and then do some abduction and kickbacks at the end. And we do two types of abduction now. We do frontal plane and horizontal pl uh, transverse plane. Uh, but because we train every other day, one quad day, I want them doing something more quad dominant, something for the quads that's more quad dominant, like a hack squat or the pendulum squat or the leg press. Uh, and then the next quad exercise, the, ne the next training session, I want them doing something more glute dominant for the quads, a leaning step up. Uh, 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 walking lunge, something that makes the glutes more sore. So we alternate between quad dominant movements. We don't always do hinges every single time for hamstrings, because if you did deadlifts and good mornings three times a week, it's too much. So it could be a deadlift one day, it could be a 45 degree hyper, which doesn't beat you up quite as much, banded or dumbbell, or it could be knee flexion. So they can also choose a knee flexion movement, like a leg curl or a Nordic ham curl, glute ham raise. And then with abduction, it's, yeah, like I said, it's, um, they can throw in kickbacks if they feel like it. If they don't feel like it, just do the four or five exercises and be done. And then I auto-regulate everything with them. It is, it, 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 someone comes in here and they're like, you know, gosh, I, every day some girls are, are, are like, oh, it's, my period started today. I just don't feel like pushing it. Okay, let's do a bunch of machines um, or I'm just feeling beat down. Okay, we're not gonna do, yeah. Speaking of that, I uh, received a whole lot of flack for posting research that the menstrual cycle in research quite conclusively does not influence strength. What are your thoughts on that? Do you think that yeah. there is a discrepancy there between research and um, real life for some reason? Or do you think it, it is the case that physiologically there's no difference, any differences are practical or mental? Because of course, you know, if you're bleeding and Especially, therefore you can't yeah. focus or you just don't want to go it to the just gym, hurt. You're in factor. pain. Yeah, you're in pain. It doesn't feel good. And you're bloated and you don't, yeah. I have clients that are like, uh, I just, I, first of all, all right, I don't, this is not my area of research. Um, I will tell you that one client I trained back in the day, Camille, back in Phoenix, every time and I don't want to use like the improper terms, um, but when she started men menstruating or mens bleeding, basically, I hope I don't you, get You it. can't say menstruating anymore? I don't know. I don't. <laughs> is that the term for bleeding? Like when you actually start bleeding, yeah, that day she would crush PRs. Like if she was deadlifting, she'd ha like the day which she would start menstruating was the day she was her strongest by far. And it was every time, whenever she'd set a PR, I'd be like, is today you're, and she'd be like, <laughs> like, she was strongest on that day. Other women, that's their weakest day. I've trained some women that it's like the day they're ovulating, they're their strongest. I've looked at the research be behind your um, hormones, and like, it's like, um, uh, like, when you're ovulating, God, I don't want to butcher this, it's been a while. Testosterone, estrogen, progesterone, I think testosterone and estrogen are really high. And maybe is relatively stable. Estrogen is um, peaks with ovulation. <laughs> and then during the, the premenstrual, it's like testosterone and estrogen dip and progesterone increases. Yeah, so follicular phase, which includes menstruation, you have higher levels of estrogen, relatively speaking, which is where the other type of research comes in from menstrual periodization, where you do more volume in the follicular phase and because estrogen is higher and you can recover yeah, quicker? Yeah, that's kind of the idea. Yeah. Yeah. Do, so, do, do you do that? With I don't mind? do any of that, and I've never done any of that. And so I think if you take averages, it, because every person is unique, uh, I've seen research where some girls are stronger during, but I think, uh, I know it was uh, Lauren Colenso Simple, uh, mm -hmm. under Stu, uh, was it under Stu Phillips? But anyway. They both have done research on that. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure what basically, they did a review paper and they found that there's no, you're not stronger. And when you take all this, when you take everyone into account, if I took my whole glue squad and averaged out their strength over their menstrual cycle, mm -hmm. you won't find 
any big differences, but individually it matters a lot for some people. Right. Some women don't see much of a difference. Some women notice a huge difference, but you also have to take into account how they feel because it's like, if they don't feel good, you know, that week, have that be a natural deload. And when I say deload, I don't mean don't train during the week. Mm -hmm. When I say deload, I mean just change it up and do more volume and less effort and do different exercises. It's like you learn how to, because half of the art of personal training is figuring out how to keep people motivated and how to keep them in, and that's one thing I love about my gym, it's fun. The women love coming here, it's fun. I try to create a fun atmosphere. They play their music. Here in Miami, it's all like, mm. we have so many Latin women and so they play their reggaeton and their, uh, you know, Carol G and all these people, I don't know who they are, but uh, Yurishna actually trains her. <laughs> She's her trainer. But uh, I make it fun in here. The women love each other and they love training every day. That's something that people so, don't talk about enough is like, yes, you know the science, but then there's another science of how to get people to like training and stick to it. And that's a and whole a, different topic. Another perspective though is that sometimes you also have to balance liking it versus pushing through. How do you balance when? Yeah, because they're not going to like it if they're not seeing results. Right. Yeah. It's, it's going to be frustrating. So that's kind of like the cult. We, so because I've popularized PRs, PRs, some neighboring gyms have started bashing my methods and saying bikini competitors shouldn't ever PR. Mm -hmm. And that annoys me because so, Okay, so how are they gonna put on muscle then? Yeah. Now, I agree that you can just not focus so much on the pill, but just training very hard each set, but not really track it, and like you could still see results. But you know when you forget your, when I forget, there's my notebook, I, tr I have a training journal. You forget it and you think, how many times do you think you set a PR and you look, oh crap, I did that two weeks ago and I forgot. And, and had you known you did that, you would have pushed yourself harder. So I'm a big fan of PRs, big proponent of them, but then I also know I've been training some girls this way for five years, PRs get harder and harder, and if you're obsessed with them, you hurt yourself, and you make stupid training decisions. So your first year of training, or two, I absolutely care a lot about progressive overload. But anyway, to answer your question, um, how do you balance out making it enjoyable and effective? Well, that's the culture you establish. And in here, it's all based on, and when you, when you see Masa and Diana doing six plates per side on the hip thrust, you don't think your three plates is a big deal anymore, you know? Mm -hmm. So that kind of solves itself. It's that type of gym where people are cheering for each other, etc. I don't have to convince anyone. They see the girls that have the best physiques that are very strong. And, it, and that's another thing I wish I could. So social media now, my girls, a lot of them are influencers. They show one rep because people's attention span is one rep now. You show like, like six exercises, one rep of six, just the concentric portion, the concentric portion of one rep of six exercises. So it ends up being 15 seconds long. But no, it ends up, it ends up being 20 seconds long because they throw in the clip of them putting their pre-workout scoop in or the picture of them putting chalk on. They're very creative. We just want to show our set. Yeah. If we do a set of 10 uh, with 405, like if we deadlift 405 for 10, we want to show all 10 reps of that. They'll just show one rep and I'm like, you know, my clients Thelma and Julia, they have big old butts and I'm like, you know, so they, I'm like, why didn't you show all 10? You just got that for 10. You just hit one, you know, you just deadlifted 155 for 20. You should show that, so you should be proud of that. And they're like, no, that doesn't get a lot of views. So I get it. These girls are stronger than you think, a lot of them. You know, they're way stronger than people think. And so to build glutes, it's not always easy. It's so genetic. It's so up to genetics. And you know, you have the muscles that you didn't ever have to train that hard. For me, it was my pecs. They just are always big. I don't ever do like crossovers and... and For me, uh, that's actually glutes and... Uh Traps. Your glutes and traps are grow easily. Yeah. Yeah. And for me, my glutes, you know, my friend, my friend Paul, um, Paul Ravella, God, he, he, I watch him train in here. 
He doesn't ever do hip thrusts. He doesn't ever train his glutes specifically, and they're huge. And I watch him do hack squats with like a 25 on each side, slow and controlled. And I'm like, how the hell do you have glutes? If I had those glutes, that his glute genetics, I would have been unstoppable. But also, if I had his glute genetics, I never would have become the glute guy because I wouldn't have researched it because would, they yeah. would have come easy for me. By the way, since you seem to be into evidence-based fitness content, you might be interested in the online Hansemans PT certification course. You'll learn absolutely everything you need to know to get results like these. The link is in the description. All right, back to the video. So if I uh, zoom out and look at your, how your overall training has developed over the years, we talked about it before a little bit, you do a lot more uh, eccentric overloading, more length and partials, more emphasis on the stretch in general. And you still place a lot of emphasis on hip abduction as well. One concern with that that I see in, in your female clients is that it increases the hip dip. Does it increase the hip dip? And if so, do the benefits outweigh the cost? Like if you get a large glute medius, large shelf here, is it just gonna make your, look, your booty look more like a guy's booty and you get more hip dip? Like what is the benefit? Why do you still do it? We're hammering frontal plane hip abduction here. And yeah, none of my girls are, are getting like, yeah. So theoretically you look at the glue, if you were to look at like, you know, the picture you and I are conjuring up in our heads is the, the glute anatomy chart. Like where Ronnie you, Coleman's glutes. Yeah, Ronnie Coleman's glutes. We're picturing this butterfly uh, like this. And here are the glute medius and the upper glute max and the lower glute max going like this. And I'm not seeing that with my girls. I'm just, and here's the other thing. So they want the shelf. Well, that, when you turn to the side, the shelf is heavily influenced by glute medius. Mm -hmm. But then if you, if, if you stand straight on, yeah, you can have hip dips. But your hip dips become more pronounced when you drop down, you know, when a woman drops down below like 11% body fat and stuff like that. If they have 15 to 20% body fat, it's not as noticeable. Mm -hmm. And a lot, of my, a lot of the influencers here, they're not competitors. They just look good year round but they eat, they, they have a healthy, sustainable lifestyle. They don't bulk and cut. They're just living a, a healthy lifestyle. Um, but uh, back to what you were saying earlier, my, my methods have changed. I am doing more eccentric loading. I'm doing less barbell stuff, even though I still love squats and deads. Um, with my girls, I'm doing a more plate loaded stuff. We've got all these hip thrust machines, you know. I showed you all my, the gluteator, um, seated hip abduction. We're leaning forward and doing pulses. Uh, we call that the snow angel machine. I showed you that body masters low back. It's bent leg back extension. The hammer strength multi-hip to do kickbacks and abduction. Um, and what if, um, circling back to the, the hip dip, what if women feel that they have too much hip dip? Is there anything they can do? Is there, would you say, embrace it, keep training or stop training, glute medius, just train as normal? Here in Miami, you might just get a BBL, but no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, honestly, like if, so it's a hard thing. It's like, are they really getting, like, it's like women who say I'm quad dominant and their quads are weak. Mm -hmm. They're just heavier, too heavy for their liking. And you have to, if you're too heavy, you store fat somewhere. Like <laughs> I have a belly right now cause I'm too heavy. I don't go, I'm ab dominant. I have fat here, you know what I mean? But a lot of women will store things, store fat in their lower body. So they'll say I'm quad or I need, I, I have hip dips or like I have saddlebags. I need to do this exercise and it's like, before you start, before you really start omitting exercises, try to get down to like, everyone has, like you have a preference, a body fat preference, where if you go over this, for you it's probably like 15%. For me, probably, yeah. I can be like 18 and still look pretty good, well, with clothes on. I can be 18 and look good with clothes on. If I go over 18%, I just look terrible. But you know, for me, the lowest I've ever gotten in my life was 
and it's hard for me to sustain. I'm like hungry all the time. But anyway, I've never gotten into single digits, but it's kind of like for a lot of women, if you know, a woman is at 25% body fat and she thinks, well, I, it, it could just be that you store a lot of fat in there and as you lean out, you actually like the way you look. Case in point, look at all the bikini competitors you know, they're being told to get more upper glutes right now. That's the latest thing. Mm -hmm. So they're doing a lot of abduction. Um, but they've always done squats and lunges. They're not so obsessed with progressive overload. They're not necessarily squatting 225, but they're doing squats every single week. But would you, would you tell them to lean out then? Because I would say lean out before you make that judgment. Make sure you're lean enough for your, like your, and it's hard to say what percentage. Because it could be 20% for one person, it could be 16% for another person. And women carry more, like, women, here's the other thing. Though, there's what, for women, there's what they like the best versus what's best for their career. And here's what's so funny, because when I grew up, everyone wanted to look like a Sports Illustrated swimsuit model or a Victoria's Secret model. And now the, the thick, Fit, whatever you call it, is more Seems popular. Like. The thick, the thick, uh, the thicker clients that I have, like I've got this client, Riss. She's got like 700 something thousand followers. She has big, bigger legs, but she looks, she, she wears it well. She looks amazing. And I'm like, Riss, I don't think you should diet. Like, I don't think you should try to lose that. I think you would lose. She's like, my followers notice if I lose five pounds, they like the thickness. And like my client Nicole in here, Estrella, they've got, they've got, they need to keep their fat because a lot of the girls have, and this is something no one talks about too, is how you store your fat. Some of these girls, my, a lot of my girls get accused of having BBLs and they don't have BBLs. They store their fat there. And it's like, how lucky are they to have like round butts? Mm -hmm. They eat more and a lot of it goes to their butts and it just makes them rounder. So let's say they're already lean. They still have hip dip. They're at their ideal body fat percentage. And they, yeah. Then I'd say, okay, let's quit doing frontal plane hip abduction. All right. So you would, you would actually then reduce. The, yeah. The but radius. it's, it's something that's talked about in theory, but I don't here at my gym, we're all doing that. Now we're, we got this machine here. So we've abandoned a lot of the cable standing hip abduction and all these exercises that I've loved to do. I, uh, I, we aren't doing as much of it cause we're doing this machine in six months. Actually, my client Bobby today said, Brett, my upper glutes have grown so much, I miss, I need to focus more on lower glutes. So I said, okay, Bobby, here's the exercise we need to, the, a lot of the girls feel their glutes a lot during the rotisserie style hip thrust. With the rotating pad, mm -hmm. they feel their lower glutes more. But then I said, okay, so rotisserie hip thrust, and then we've got all this axial loaded stuff. So your squat variations, your step ups, your split squats, your lunges, your RDLs, all that stuff, and then leaning seated hip abduction, because that works the lower glutes more. Speaking or, of uh, regional hypertrophy, how important do you think it is for the glutes to separate upper and lower? Because in our study, we didn't find a difference. I know, it blows my mind. So that's something that's good to talk about. It's like our study, it just, a good researcher, like we, we have some finding and you just, it peaks, you go, hmm, I'm gonna wait till, I'm gonna wait to hear more. Cause squats, like you can have people doing like, oh, for example, oh, one other exercise that works the low glutes really well is that kickback I showed you on the multi-hip, going real high and just doing the length and partials. Mm -hmm. But I'll have my girls do the whole stack on the multi-hip. I think it goes up to 305 pounds and they're just doing from the leg up really high, deep hip flexion down to about not quite to vertical. So they're just doing this range, but that can make your glutes sore kind of like lunges do, but without the quad soreness. So I'm always trying to figure out extra things, extra volume for glutes that takes the quads out of it. Cause if I do, if I did what like Mike Isretel mm -hmm. um, espoused with my girls, their quads and hamstrings would probably get too big for their liking. In fact, I've got a lot of these bikini, and, I feel like Mike just showed that he does not work with any bikini competitors because like my, my, my client, Diana, she looks amazing. They're like, do not grow your quads or hamstrings, just a little more glutes. So we have to not in whatever they do grows their quads. 
So we can't do the squats and the lunges. And Diana fills her glutes with squats a lot, but we can't do them because it, her quads get out of control. So in bikini, you know, it's about proportions and symmetry and the, it, you have to have that look. So anyway, regional hypertrophy, in our study, we found that the squat and the hip thrust developed all the glute regions fairly similarly. And I'm like, neither of them grew the glute medius much at all. And the upper middle and lower glute max grew about the same. And I'm like, everyone thinks that hip thrusts work more upper glutes and squats and like lunges work more lower glutes. And you can feel it. Like you can palpate people's glutes and feel the tension. And I would swear that squats you f and like lunges, you feel the lower glute max more than the upper glute max. So what does that mean? Does that mean palpation is not accurate or it was just because it was beginners and maybe you see more difference over time? I don't know. I do think it's important, mm -hmm. but I'm open to changing my mind. I'd like to see more research emerge. A lot of things it's like, you gotta wait till more research comes out. Yeah. If, more, if more research keeps coming out, showing that all hip extension exercises grow your, but it's funny, I kinda don't like, you know, we always, for glute max, hip extension is king, hip extension is king, and lately I've been thinking, I wanna, how do you target the glute max? First of all, half the hip extension exercises, if you're doing uh, squatting motion, you're working your quads. If you're doing a hinging motion, you're working your hamstrings. And deadlifts work your quads too, you know. But if you're doing hip extension with, you know, if your knee is bent, it takes the hamstrings out of it a little bit. But if the, knee, if the leg straightens, then you're doing adductors, hamstrings, and glutes. And you have to be working all three of them. Now, if you do like the gluteator and you kind of do hip extension and abduction at the same time, does that take the adductors out of it a little bit? Maybe, maybe if you put a band around the knees, it, it, it hits, it sends more neural drive to the glutes. That's another topic. I'm a fan of bands. I feel like everything people bash, I love bands, I love sumo, I love shortened position. But anyway, <laughs> um, um, I'm thinking more of like, how can I grow the glutes with posterior, like if there was a way to load just posterior pelvic tilt, mm -hmm. how that, that would, yes, it wouldn't be a large range of motion, but you could do it every day. And if it was just a real convenient way, just like squeezing your glutes against resistance, or how, I wish there was like a machine that lets you just do extra rotation that might be more upper glute, not as much lower, but anyway, it would be, uh, it would be a very effective like upper glute max. But like you we said, deep, you, what you showed, deep hip flexion with abduction, abduction. yeah, deep hip flexion. Deep I showed, the upper yeah, glutes. yeah. Well, I don't know. That might work lower when you're super deep and abducting. I know that, like, yeah, we, I've had argu argument with Chasm where he says that no, that's the, you know, the. <laughs> sacral fibers or the deep, the iliac fibers and the sacrum fibers, not the coccygeal fibers. It is. I don't know though. I, I know when you're, when we do the seated hip abduction leaning way forward, you feel it and you see it in their low glute max, but it, maybe I'm just seeing it. Maybe I'm not looking at their lowest, but when I did EMG, I had, I, I didn't publish this. I had like 12 of my girls do this. And I should have published it. I have the data. Uh, I had them in the bottom of a squat, doing an isometric as hard as they can for five seconds. Then they would not change position, and I had them push out as hard as they can for five seconds. And I changed up the order. The order was randomized, so you could push out first or squat. Anyway, what I found was even in deep, super deep hip flexion, the gluteus maximus, every, first of all, the glute medius and the upper, mid, and lower, even the lower glute max fired harder pushing out compared to pushing up. And it was like three times higher activation. Mm -hmm. Like if the glute max got 10% uh, mean uh, pushing up, then it got 30% mean activation pushing out, so, mean versus peak. But anyway. How important do you think, the, or how predictive do you think EMG is? And well, in that scenario, you're at the same muscle length. Mm -hmm. I don't know, how could it not? Yeah, that's how could it not? Because it's at the same muscle length. 
Maybe there's some, I don't know. I would love to see a study on that. There's so many things, men, you and I could sit in here and come up with 15 studies and they'll never be done. I wish so bad mm -hmm. the things we argue about, you could just, we had like 10 guys out there that were on it, planning it, and then like, yeah, eight, eight months later, it's, you get the data, you know, mm -hmm. they, they publish a, a, a preprint and you can see the data and you can go, ah, oh, but it's like, we'll have these arguments for years. It's so rare to have training studies come out. And even when you do, look at what happened with our paper. Ooh, those are just beginners. Oh, Contreras picked the, hand picked the subjects and he, he doctored it to favor hip thrusts. Um, it's just the way our industry is. It's, just, it's unfortunate we don't, uh, but like I said, the long length, but here's something I wanted to talk about. Um, you mentioned how, my, how I'm doing more length and partials and more, more eccentric loading in here. And the, in particular, the eccentric loading where I'm really, because I've got all these plate loaded machines. So the glute drive, I could just sit on it, but I make them control it all the way into the stretch. Uh, the, that body master's low back, I'm pushing down, having them fight me into the stretch. This snow angel machine, I'm pushing them, it's frontal plane hip abduction, but I'm pushing them into neutral. And then I have them do, have them do an ISO hold at neutral position, you know, 15 seconds, because you don't have a lot of tension in there with a lot of the exercises. So I'm doing all that because I don't know the answer to half these things. I will fully admit, I, know, I don't know much. <laughs> we don't, we have, if we just look by the published research, what do we have, three studies? We've got the Kubo squat you depth. Glute hypertrophy. Glute, gluteus maximus. We've got the Kubo, we've got the Plotkin study, and we've got uh, the Ca Ca Cassiano. Yeah, most of the studies that involve what else? squats, leg presses, and the like, I don't think they measured the glutes. <laughs> no. So. so if we just went by published uh, experiments, we've got like three studies to go. And the Cassiano, do, what does it tell us? Does it tell us? Hip thrusts are, it was just, that was just added volume. So because I don't know the answer to things, I don't, and so that's one thing I wish you saw more from guys in our industry. I don't know. I don't know the answer. Everyone pretends to know what the best gluteus maximus exercise is, what the best combinations are, what the, um, and since I don't know the answer to all these things, I, I have my opinion, mm -hmm. but I don't want to be wrong. So I'm giving the girl more length and part, giving the girls more length and partials um, and because what if that comes, that emerges down the road to be the best way to grow the gluteus maximus? We'll find out in time, but You're in the meantime, best. I don't want to take two years and be wrong, and then my, my clients got sort, shortchanged as a result of it, you know? Mm -hmm. and, that, and, and it's funny, too, because I feel like uh, when people read about my methods, they're like, you know, Contreras just gives hip thrusts and, like, bans his clients, and it's like, my San Diego squad, I would say, is the strongest all-natural female gym in the world. There's no one that could beat us. There's like, if I took my 30 girls and you know took my top 15, there's no gym in the world, in my opinion, that could beat them. At, at like, maybe maybe there's powerlifting gyms, but they're all natural. None of them take things. Mm -hmm. None of them take stuff. They don't take. Anavar, they don't take any steroids, they don't take peptides, they don't do anything. Uh, and but you yeah, know. <laughs> I'm, I'm pretty, we're like, I'm pretty sure. Um, but like, cause they're like my best friends, you know? And so, um, so we, yeah, I got them very strong at squats. I got them very strong at deadlifts. I've gotten them strong. So it's like you, these people online who will bash my programs the only thing I do different than them is I add in, like they'll give squats and deadlifts and like quad and hamstring things. And then I, I add in more glute stuff and then they bash me. How could my program not be better than theirs if I'm adding in a little more volume for glutes? It's such a weird industry. But the way I see it, I don't, since this new research is emerging with the long length stuff, don't fight it. I'd come out with, now I'm experimenting, coming out with all the ways, the long length stuff, like new mm -hmm. exercise things to try. Like that rotisserie hip thrust is hard at the bottom. It, it makes it easier at the top. Um, the eccentric loading, the single leg landmine, but also all the lunges and the squats. It's like 
Make sure you're doing those just in case that's the best way to grow your glutes. And then people don't fault me. People don't go, oh, Contreras led us astray because I'm always trying to go by the latest science. Whereas I feel like some people just get so pigeonholed into one thing, they'll never change their mind. They'll never change their mind even if no matter how much data emerges. Yeah, I think that's, that's, that's also why I'm talking to you because I can say for sure that you are not a salad. Like yeah. a lot of people, uh, I think a lot of people unfairly portray you as a salad, like it processes everything, you're just selling your process, whatever. And that's absolutely not true. Like you will 100% adopt your training practices based on the latest science. Uh -huh. And you are clearly even willing to fund a study that might prove you wrong. And when it proves you wrong or the findings are different than what you expected, then you change your training. Yeah. And I cannot say Thank that for you. a lot of people. Thank you. So that's why we're talking and you said I don't know much I think you do know a lot about these topics so while we have disagreements on various of these topics and sometimes it's a matter of nuance sometimes we just have very different methods but we both appreciate the science and we will both adopt our opinions as new science comes in and really shows us okay this is something now we it's not not a matter of debate anymore we're, we were just wrong about this yeah and and that's the main point there we will change our minds it might take it might take you or me three studies to change our minds, but we will change our minds and, and we will be open-minded to being wrong. Or we won't, if a new study comes out, we won't say things as boldly as we once did. And I think that's missing in today's social media. I don't think you're on social media that much, are you? Because I'm not on it much, no. I post on it much. But, yeah, uh, I don't you post and get off. <laughs> I, I get trapped. I never used to get trapped. I'm not the best sleeper, so sometimes I look, and my, my search feed knows what I like. But anyway, lately, ugh, it's so frustrating. It's like, before these algorithms, scientists had power. Mm -hmm. You remember how strong the evidence-based industry was? There were like 15 of us, yep. and we had power. And we could, we could cast doubt on the the charlatans and the pseudoscience and we could we could level them out you know and now it's like the more it's like i i because the things that come up on your search obviously are things that are going viral so this thing will have three hundred thousand likes and it's wrong it's dead wrong and i'm going this is what everyone's seeing is wrong stuff the world is become, becoming dumber because of the algorithms we don't have the power we once did. So I appreciate you and the rest of the evidence-based community very much. I like to think that in the end, the prevailing norms will always gravitate towards the actual truth. And science is the best way to find out the truth. So in the long run, we should always end up being right if, as long as we go with uh, what the science says. But it's just frustrating. Yeah, it doesn't, social media. it doesn't matriculate. Is that the word? It doesn't, I guess so, yeah. I don't know if that's the right word, but it doesn't develop, develop faster. Yeah. If like, if Instagram, someone told me this about China. I don't know if it's true or not. If it is true, it'd be hilarious. The Chinese TikTok rewards educators and science and they get preferentially, whereas the, um, the US, the American version of TikTok it's just based on entertainment. Yeah, they do actually. If that's true, yeah. that's hilarious because yeah. China would be going, we want to be smarter over time. We want Americans to be dumber over time. I don't think that would be anyway. If that's true, um, we should care about that because we're going there. You know, how cool would it be if we got like an extra, like your stuff's going to go viral easier because you have proven yourself to be a good scientist and caring about truth. But no, we don't have that. We we have to have good delivery and an interesting personality yeah in your yeah. Heart. <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah. No, that, that, <laughs> and that latter being the most important now is your physique and you can just say anything you want if you have a jacked physique it's a little frustrating lately because i feel like it's getting worse we we in the during before instagram in the, in the facebook era and then in the beginning of instagram uh science-based content was i mean remember the infographic craze like that was, we, we, it was more scientific and now it's just um, attention spans have gone down and it's more about your physique and how good you are at editing reels. Yeah. You've got to be a little movie developer, you know? 
well, the people are still watching right now, they are definitely not in that category. Yeah. So I want to thank you for your time. Thank you. And where can people find you? Do you have um, anything uh, in the making? Any new loop machines? I have my plate loaded hip thrusters. Funny, I ordered 22 of them. I sold like 17 in the last, I don't know, month or two, but that would have sold out overnight back in the day. Mm -hmm. I think it's become saturated, you know, but I do have pride in my products. My BC Strength products, I feel like I've got the best plate loaded, yeah, Sarah tried it. I've got the pl best plate loaded hip thrust unit in the market. I've got the best 45 degree hyper because I don't put things out. I test them with my clients for like sometimes up to a year before I put them out there and we keep tweaking. Mm -hmm. So with the 45 degree hyper, you've got to make it usable. Uh, and I, I take my five foot female clients and make sure they can, it fits them. Because half these big machines that we love, you know, from like Arsenal Strength and these giant, they make them for men, for big jack dudes. And then the women get on them, they're doing a hip thrust and their knee angle is like this and they feel it all in their hammies or something, you know what I mean? Um, or like they're doing a hack squat and they, they don't even get to parallel before it bottoms out. So I try to make it uh, usable for like a wide, like you can be five foot, you can be six foot six, six eight and still use my equipment and so yeah, I don't have any new machines I want to have in time because I keep thinking, how long can I be the glute guy until I, it's creepy? Like I'm 47 right now. <laughs> can I be 55? At what time, at what point is it like, ew, why is he the glute guy? That's weird. So um, like I have my booty by Brett. That's my main thing. I think over in 10 years, maybe I'll switch to BC strength being my main moneymaker and having my own plate loaded because I love hammer strength. I love all these plate loaded models. I'd love to have my own line, but it is a tough market to crack. Like I said, I thought I was gonna sell these out overnight and it's taken me a while. So I've got to learn how to infiltrate the commercial gym market. My products for, are for home use. So yeah, I'm always working on stuff, but lately I've been trying to not do too much. Right, and everything's on bradscontrails.com? I don't even update that anymore. <laughs> do you use your website still? Not much anymore. Yeah, no. I know. Remember the days when we would blog? Choose a th like a thumbnail uh -huh. or like film a YouTube video, embed it in the blog, post the blog, post the link on Facebook and yeah. Twitter, and then send it out to our newsletter. That was like the drill. And then now it's changed a lot. But anyway, yeah, it's mainly just my Instagram. That's where I post everything. Right. I'm active on my stories. And that's really all the social media I do now. I don't do Twitter anymore. I don't do Facebook. I don't do TikTok. I'm just on Instagram. All right. Best contrarious, everyone. Thank you. Mm -hmm.